podcast, an inside look at California politics and the state legislature. I am your host, Assemblyman Josh Hoover, and excited to be joined today by Matt Ross, who works with Californians Against Retail Theft, also known as CART. Uh, Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on. And I think this is a very timely topic to talk Mm -hmm. about, obviously, your organization and uh, but really, more specifically, some of the stuff going on in retail theft and what we've seen over the last few years. Uh, just to give people a brief update on what CART is, Californians Against Retail and Residential Theft is a broad-based coalition calling for needed changes in California's criminal justice system. Uh, CART urges California officials to act to undo the damage done by Proposition 47, which passed a about a decade ago now, and put an end to retail and residential theft on Main Street and in our neighborhoods. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely put some more information about mm-hmm. CART in the um, in the show notes as well. But wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe give us a little more about your background okay. and, and and what 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 brought you to, to, to working <laughs> on this stuff. Well, I've been uh, working on criminal justice issues since the 1990s. Uh, when I first moved up to Sacramento, I started at the Attorney General's office. Uh, back then, there was actually a, a Republican. I know it's hard to yeah, believe there was a statewide <laughs> office holder that, that was, was Republican. Yeah. yeah, it was quite a while ago. And I started actually as a speechwriter there and worked my way oh, and wow. ended up in the press office. Wow. So I worked on numerous issues there. And one of the big things I focused on were the statistics. Because when you look at the numbers, it kind of tells you a story. Mm. And then you need the anecdotal stories to go with it to kind of explain what's really going on. But the numbers tell you year to year, are we doing better? Are we doing worse? Do we need to make some changes? and things of that nature. From there, mm. I went to work for the legislature for about a decade, and then I worked on a couple campaigns. So I worked on the juvenile, uh, I was a campaign manager for Proposition 21 back in 2002, the Juvenile Crime and Gang Initiative. Oh, wow. And then I've worked for a couple campaigns. I worked for Sheriff Scott Jones when he ran, mm. and I also was a, a volunteer over and Helped out early on with uh, Tian Ho, who's now a Sacramento County District oh, Attorney. Yeah. yeah. So I've been around the issue for quite a bit. I see how it really impacts people, and that's why I've kind of continued to kind of focus on the issue of crime. Very much appreciate Tian Ho. I actually was meeting with him recently, yeah. and uh, uh, him and I are both uh, live in the same city. So we're, <laughs> we're, he's, a, he's a constituent and a really, really great DA. So Yeah, and you need uh, to have him on your show if you haven't had him yet. His, oh, his yeah. life story is amazing. You know what? I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, <laughs> actually, that's a great idea, and we, we will get him on at some point, I'm sure, because that's, yeah, that's definitely, I mean, even when I just meet with mm-hmm. them, right, just mm-hmm. like his perspective on what's right. going on on, mm-hmm. the, on the criminal justice right. front mm-hmm. is, is really fascinating, and, and, and really the barriers that he has to deal with right? in terms of holding people accountable, it's right. tough, right, mm-hmm. so especially in California. Absolutely. Um, so tell us a little, little more about CART and uh, kind of the... I guess the genesis of CARD and, mm-hmm. and, and how it came to be. So we started about two and a half, almost three years ago. And our focus really is that we kept seeing a dramatic increase in crime happening in our stores and in our neighborhoods. Porch piracy is also a big issue, mm-hmm. especially when we right when we're coming out of COVID. So that's how we, that was our genesis. Um, we are now an organization of more than 300 members of from very large, like the Chamber of Commerce and California Chamber of Commerce. We've got California Business Roundtable, Grocers Association, but we're primarily small and ethnic businesses. They're the ones who are kind of the forgotten ones in the 100%. battle against, against crime. And unfortunately, when they get burglarized or they, get, they have shoplifting, they don't have the same ability to bounce back as the large retailer. Yep. Um, so when the large retailers, they can absorb some of that cost, when the mom and pop stores lose five hundred or a thousand or two thousand dollars in a one fell swoop, it's much harder for them to make it up. So that's really kind of how we started, mm-hmm. and our real focus is to kind of see the changes in Prop Forty Seven because when Prop Forty Seven came through in twenty fourteen, there were a lot of unintended consequences no one really thought about. One of the biggest ones we've really seen is we've changed the rules for theft with a prior. We got essentially got rid of that designation mm-hmm. completely. So if I commit my first crime or my 50th shoplifting crime, I get the exact same penalty. So there's no incentive to slow someone down once they start. They mm. just keep going through and through and through. And so that's one of the big problems we've seen with it. That's one of the things we want addressed. And I know the legislature is always talking about wanting to try and fix it, but there's only so much a legislature can do. When the initiatives are passed, most of them have language in there that says it can only be in furtherance of the act. 
people would say right. this made crimes softer, so you can only go that direction. Yeah, that's re- uh, really a, a not something talked about enough in right. terms of the <laughs> the limiting of you know obviously there's a lot of reasons why direct democracy is a good thing, mm-hmm. uh, but it also comes with its challenges when yes, you talk does. about how it does create uh, really ties the hands of of uh, you know editing. Mm-hmm. laws uh if something doesn't work out right? right you almost uh need another initiative and that that can obviously be a, a big hill to climb so um yeah it so it's interesting i love that you brought up the small businesses because i mm-hmm. think the small businesses are the ones that really do get forgotten about i mean right. when you read the media stories you hear about the major smash and grabs like a lot of the organized retail theft right right um, you hear a lot about the the targets and the WalMarts and the Nordstroms and and I you know it's really important that we are aware of those obviously, um, but what we don't hear a lot about is how retail theft is impacting small businesses and mm-hmm. you know I met with a I actually we were we were both there yeah, uh, a Folsom, group yeah. of Folsom small businesses a few months ago mm-hmm. now I guess and just talked to people and people are really frustrated they're. They're frustrated because they can't afford to lose a thousand, two thousand dollars in mm-hmm. merchandise to theft. Right. Um, you know, it was interesting. I uh, was learning recently about shrinkage rate, right? For these businesses, <laughs> yes. right? It's something that I didn't really uh, know about prior, but the shrinkage rate is is obviously the percentage of product, and you can correct me if right. I'm wrong on this definition, but it's the percentage of product that you lose without someone paying for it. Uh, as a percentage of the you know total mm-hmm. that you that you sell or that you have, um, and most businesses, from what I've heard, try to keep that below one percent. Like, you know, you don't want to lose more than one or two percent of your product, obviously, to right. either breaking or theft or whatever mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Um, and uh, you know, the I think it was the Nordstrom in San Francisco and Union mm-hmm. Square that closed, or, or right. it was the Macy's. I think I'm sorry, uh, the Macy's in San Francisco that closed. It's like a sixteen percent shrinkage rate. Right, mostly due to retail theft, obviously, mm-hmm. and um, it's just that's that's mind boggling to like even think about, right? Like just <laughs> like the level. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that specifically, but yeah, I yeah. really appreciate bringing so, up the small business. Yeah, so one of the one of our key spokespeople is is the small independent business. They own roughly seventy four independent grocery stores, primarily disadvantaged communities mm-hmm. in Southern California. They actually spread from Bakersfield to almost to South Orange County but they're almost all in disadvantaged communities. They get more than 100 notifi- theft notifications daily. Oh my God. So they're uh, getting- Amongst uh, all their stores? Amongst this, all their okay, stores. Wow. So that's 35,000 annually, a theft notification amongst all their stores. Wow. So they've gone through, they've realized they're losing well over in excess of a million dollars. They now have to make that up. There's only a couple <laughs> ways you can make that up, right? You either can raise the price on a couple big items. Yep. yep. To make up that difference, you can raise the price on all items to make up that difference, or you've got to go the other way, which is you got to find ways to reduce costs. And that reducing costs means either I'm going to have fewer staff, labor, right, labor is gone, right. Right. or I'm going to have to shut down a store. Yep. And they're already in the disadvantaged communities, and so he's always trying to find a way to make up the difference. They're also doing everything they can to try and reduce this, and they're still having the numbers like this with security at different locations, changing the paths pathways through the store so it's not as easy to get through the liquor aisle straight to the front wow. door um they've got locking carts mm-hmm. so if you don't pay the carts lock they'll just dump the stuff and run it run to the car with it and it's pretty obvious and they've got video cameras everywhere and when you see people it's they have literally hours of videos of mm-hmm. people committing these thefts that they can't be held accountable and yeah. they can't be held accountable because what are you right. going to do i report it but now you need the next step. And what's what's the potential punishment for this? It's really kind of like a fix-it ticket if for the most part. it's a misdemeanor in right. California, it's a slap on the wrist. Right. And, and even if you can say, oh, they stole 1500 well, they start negotiating back and say, well, it's only 900 <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and, they, that, and they know. They know right. <laughs> the law very well. They right? do. Uh, and they are also targeting specific items. Like, hey, they know the high-ticket high items, so they grab a couple high-ticket items, throw a couple low-ticket items in there. To mix mix them it all up, so in case you grab them, like oh no, we had more of the cigarettes. We had we didn't have that much liquor, or we had more of some small item, not as much of the high expensive items. But he says first things they always hit are frozen foods, diapers, and liquor. 
<laughs> he goes, those are the three aisles. So they're just working over. You know, it's amazing to me something you just <clears throat> said is, I mean, the amount that even this these small businesses are mm-hmm. investing. Right. You said locking carts, obviously cameras, right. uh, um, you know, rearranging stores. I know some of the larger retailers have invested heavily in locking mechanisms mm-hmm. for their products, right? right? Like putting, you know, their underwear and their mm-hmm. cosmetics, right, behind right. glass and with mm-hmm. lock and key, which, by the way, is a, <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I can't tell you the complaints that I get from people who don't want to shop that way, right? Like Absolutely. where you have to call an employee over to open a glass case and then they literally, they have a policy in a lot of these stores where they have to walk you to the register <laughs> with the product so you don't take off with it. Uh, that's not workable. And, and, and I will also bring up that, um, you know, our, our city governments, right? I've got three mm-hmm. cities in my district. They want people to shop in person. Right. Why? Because when you shop online, uh, the tax revenue gets split in a million different directions mm-hmm. and a lot less of it goes to your local city, right? And so there's always a huge pit push to buy in person, buy local, shop small, whatever, you right. know, whatever mm-hmm. it is, because that also helps your city and helps your investments in your city. But these changes, I mean, they really push people more online, I think. And right. I, I think that's another huge concern that isn't always considered. Well, and when you think about it, once again, who's putting up the locking mechanisms and everything else? Once again, it's the large retailers because they have the resources. Yeah, the right. mom and pop store can't do it. If you're a sure. one store of something, you literally, yeah. you just truly can't do those types of things. So this is why we've been in a big push to see reforms to 47, because there really isn't any teeth behind the laws currently if someone commits something wrong. And I'm a firm believer in a carrot and a stick. Yep. I've got kids, but if I tell them there's a punishment and then they keep committing it and I keep giving them the same punishment, it's not doing something. That, to me, is the definition of insanity. I'm expecting a different result. I'm not going right. to get a different result. We need to be able to have something that allows us to bump up the penalty if someone's a repeat offender. Yep. And that's kind of what's sure. missing right now in, in the whole mechanism. Uh, the Manhattan Institute came out with a, a study last week, and they titled their study, California's uh, Prop 47 Exacerbated Crime and Drug Abuse. They looked at all the crimes that were covered under 47, and what they noticed is that Prop 47 increased reoffending, so more people were reoffending than before, as well as failure to appear in court. So I'm going to reoffend more, and I'm not going to go show up in court, and no one's coming after me. On the other side of that, it also stated that there was a significant drop in arrests. So people are reoffending, we're arresting fewer people, fewer people are being sentenced, and fewer people are participating in drug court. And unfortunately, when we talk about what's going on, there were multiple victims in this. The mm-hmm. store owner in the store is a victim because someone's taking from them. Yep. The employees, they don't feel safe. They want to report it. They want to stop something, but most businesses don't want them to stop it because they're afraid their employees may get hurt. We don't know what that person's going to do who's stealing something once confronted. The customers don't feel safe. So we've got these three entities. And then the last part of this is by not doing anything, we're also not taking care of actually the criminal. Most criminals who are committing these types of crimes have an issue. It's a substance abuse. It's a mental health issue. They're not stealing this because they're starving. That's a very small percentage, and that's an argument a select few want to make. Sure. For the vast majority, they have a drug or substance abuse problem. They have a gambling problem. They have some sort of mental health issue, and it needs to be addressed. And if you're not addressing it, it's only going to get worse. And more likely, they're going to commit a larger crime that's going to get them much more time in jail and get somebody hurt rather than a, nipping it in the bud early. Um, when I worked at the Department of Justice, we used to always talk about there's a it's a stair step into, in the criminal justice field. It's a stair step in, yeah. in substance abuse problems. No one starts right off with heroin when it comes to drugs. They start off with something smaller, and they yeah. work their way up. No one starts with murder. It's very rare for that to happen. Yeah. It's almost always I started at one end, worked my way up, kept doing something, and no one stopped me or intervened with me along the way to help correct the path. And if you don't ever correct the path, we're going to continue to see these problems over and over and over again. So talk about drug courts for a minute, mm-hmm. <clears throat> just about wh- what does that look like for a drug court and uh, what, why, what, what did Prop 47 do to kind of harm them? Okay, so, so drug courts w- was a great program. And what it was, it was if you got arrested, if you got charged, you had an option. You could go before the drug court and say, I would rather go to a substance program trying to address my issue rather than go to prison. 
And so this was literally their choice. You've got prison or you can go and get rehab. It was widely considered widely successful. Almost every county had them. Since Prop 47 went into effect, they have dropped by almost 60, by more than two thirds of the amount of people participating in these drug courts. Yeah. And it's really sad to kind of see because unfortunately people need to hit a rock bottom before they go and get help. I don't know if you've had substance abuse in your family. I know I've had it in mine. I remember my cousin, yeah. their rock bottom was when their grandmother finally said, I can't help you anymore. And that yeah. was their rock bottom. But for everybody, it's different, right? Does your family no longer deal with you? That could be your rock bottom. Did you lose your job? That could be your rock bottom. Did you get kicked out of the house yep. or lose your home? That could be your rock bottom. Mm -hmm. For some people, it is that first conviction, and it's that chance of actually going to prison. That's their rock bottom, and that helps get them on the path. If they don't ever hit rock bottom, yeah. that end result is never good because the only other option is then to keep using until you can't use anymore. And the other thing that we've seen since Prop 47 passed is the drug, the number of people who have died from drug overdoses in this state has more than doubled since the passage of Prop, Proposition 47. So in a decade, we now have more than 11,000 people who are dying every year from drugs. We were talking less than, less than right around 5,000 back in 2014. It's incredible. And it's, it's amazing, too, when you talk to people <clears throat> who have gotten sober and really came back out mm -hmm. of these situations where they got their life back on track, so many times what they'll tell you is, you know, the best thing that happened to me is I got arrested. Right. And the best thing that happened, e even though it was a terrible thing, obviously mm -hmm. there's nothing good about the actual experience. Right. <laughs> um, it was the wake-up call that I needed to get my life back on track. And we, we cannot uh, discount that, right? right? And, you know, another argument that's often made, right, mm -hmm. about uh, Proposition 47 is all the money we're saving from not incarcerating people. And I certainly believe in second chances and mm -hmm. believe that uh, to the extent that we can rehabilitate in California, mm -hmm. we absolutely need to do that. Right. And I think that's actually what drug courts are trying to do, by the right. way. Right, absolutely. Uh, but uh, also, at the end of the day, you know, you're not... You, you, the, the the taxpayer dollars that you're saving mm -hmm. by maybe using less uh, space in your prisons mm -hmm. uh, is easily uh, canceled out by the amount of uh, the co the cost of the crime that is being committed right. that is not only being passed along in taxpayer resources such as police response and a mm -hmm. number of other things, but also reflects. Uh, or hits consumers in the form of higher prices. Right. Because if, uh, to your point earlier, if you're stealing this, there's only so much you can do to make up for it. And in most cases, that means raising your prices, right? Right. And so I think that it's really important that we don't forget about the cost of the actual crimes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and and not just think of it as a, a, a pure cost of uh, incarceration. So. Right. Well, and I always try and remind people that when we talk about criminal justice, there's kind of four pillars, right? We try and talk, we... When you're going in, we look at part for deterrence. We're hoping that we're setting sure. a crime that's going to keep someone from committing a crime in the first place. That's what that's the deterrent part, right? That's what I'm hoping is working on my kids. Better be working on my kids because there's gonna be, <laughs> there will be a bigger punishment. Then there's then there's the punishment component, right? You've yeah. done something wrong. We got to punish you. Then there is the rehabilitation, and I would say up until probably the 2010s, we probably didn't focus enough on rehabilitation, sure. but we're focusing those efforts. Yeah. But now we've backed off on the other two. And then the final one is incapacitation. If you're in prison, you can't commit those crimes that you just right. committed. You're locked up. You're un incapable of doing it. But we'd much rather get to you through rehab. No one wants to incapacitate you and put you in prison for a while. No one wants to punish you with extended periods of time. Yeah. And we really are hoping that deterrence and rehabilitation, that carrot and that stick, are working hand in hand to kind of get people to go the right path. Um, one of the great things when I was working for DOJ, we, I did a lot of the death penalty, and I remember Diane Feinstein, the senator at the time, said that she was for the death penalty. And the reason why is she remembered reading a story that happened in San Francisco where a guy committed an armed robbery, and he intentionally made sure the gun was empty and not loaded. He actually checked it three times because he goes, I did not want to kill someone and get the death penalty. Mm. And to her, she heard the deterrent that she wanted to hear that would kept somebody from doing, he already did something stupid, but he didn't go and take a life. He wanted to ensure he could not it take someone's life. Yeah. So there was a deterrent factor. Didn't stop him from robbing, right. but stopped him from taking a life. 
So that's one of those things. It, it, there's a, always a delicate balance. I think right now we're out of balance. We're yeah. too focused on rehabilitation. And really, we have no punishment virtually yeah. there now. And we have virtually no deterrence. Um, a store owner in Hollywood uh, spoke before the Little Hoover Commission. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how someone came into her store, was looking at one of her books, and says, hey, how much is this book? And she told her, oh, it's about $150. You know, it's really elaborate and all these different things. And she goes, well, I can just walk out of here. And the, the person who was looking at the book says, I can just walk out of here right now with your book, and nothing's going to happen. So what's my cost now? She said, it's still $150. But she says, but that was one of those things that kind of rocked her to record. Like, it's true. I have nothing um, she could do to stop wow. the person. And the person's really trying to haggle with her because of that, because you have a book. <laughs> and Incredible. someone else may steal it. So that's really kind of where we are. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely incredible. It was interesting. I was at a um, an event recently with a a. I'll just, I mean, this might be public information. I don't know, but it was with a um, someone in the criminal justice system who mm -hmm. uh, works in law enforcement mm -hmm. and has a, a nephew who is actually on the streets. And and so you know, to your point earlier, I mean, a, a family member that this is actually impacting, right? Yes. And hearing the story. Uh, the other night, what uh, was really, really powerful because, you know, he talked about the mentality of this family member, mm -hmm. right, who um, literally, he has a fentanyl addiction, first of all, mm -hmm. so it's a substance abuse uh, right. issue, and um, knows that if he can scrounge together, I think it's something like $80 a day, mm -hmm. uh, that he can continue to live this life without, right. pretty much without consequence. And, you know, uh, continue uh, being in that place. Right. Um, and so he, you know, spends most of his day uh, asking for money on street corners uh, from, you know, panhandling or just looking mm -hmm. for uh, donations from passersby. Mm -hmm. uh, and he knows usually that's enough. But if that's not enough, he also knows that he can go and steal something and, right. uh, you know, uh, sell that and and make, make up the rest of the money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... And it's all to feed, uh, uh, you know, honestly, his drug habit and obviously his basic needs of probably nutrition. <laughs> um, but, you know, just hearing about that and hearing about the fact that we, in some ways, by ignoring, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to your, to, I guess, your point earlier about not letting people hit rock bottom, we're really enabling right. this type of lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that is a humane thing to do, right? Because right. The, the humane thing to do is to get this person assistance and sometimes and we actually know not sometimes a lot of the time people don't do it voluntarily right right they just don't and right. they they won't seek that voluntarily um so it's yeah it, it was it was really interesting to hear uh that story uh, i why don't you tee us up with a little bit of um kind of like the the statistics you've got because i know you've got a lot of thoughts oh, yeah. on <laughs> statistics on retail theft in california let's talk about the numbers and then maybe get into what are some of the policy solutions okay yeah. Yeah, so I'll start with the numbers. So since, so we just got had crime in California report come out from the Attorney General's office back in July, and if you look back over the past ten years since Prop Forty Seven passed, retail theft has has increased by more than seventeen percent. Now that may not sound like much, but it's at its highest level since nineteen ninety eight. Now I don't know how much you remember of nineteen ninety eight, but at that point in time. Yeah. Bill Clinton was president. Sure. Okay. The Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan were winning the WNBA. And Peyton Manning? The WNBA or the, the NBA? The NBA. Oh, the NBA. <laughs> winning, winning the NBA. And Peyton Manning? Yeah. He was drafted into the NFL. <laughs> That's hilarious. Right? My kids don't even know who Peyton Manning is because he's been out of the, yeah, yes. the league yeah. so yeah, long, exactly. right? Yeah, you now forget he's about, just the guy in the commercials. He's the guy in the commercials, yeah. the guy who's doing the, doing the TV shows. <laughs> but... Not only has shoplifting gone up, violent crime has gone up by almost 30% hmm. during that same time. Yeah. Murder is up 11%. You know, so we're seeing crime after crime after crime going up. The one I find the most astonishing is motor vehicle theft is also up about 30%. Wow. Yeah. But yet we hear shoplifting is up only 17 And I always like to look a little bit closer at the numbers. But if you look at the actual numbers, there were more reported, and this is why I always talk about reported crimes, because... When you look at shoplifting, there were actually more reported auto thefts than shoplifting. And if I break your window in your car and take something out, that's, that's 
goes in the shoplifting larceny okay. pile. That doesn't go under motor vehicle theft. Mm. So that tells you either people are really stealing a ton of cars and we're focusing all our efforts in the wrong spot or we're underreporting. And I know it's underreporting. It's just obvious. We, 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 yeah. How many of us have seen an auto theft? How yeah. many of us have seen someone shoplift? Yeah. I go around talking to people and ask them to raise their hand. Have you seen someone who's, have you been a victim of shoplifting or seen it happen in one right. of your store while you're there? Almost everybody raises their hands. Yeah. Did you do something about it? No, almost nobody raises their hands. Do you know if it was reported? Almost nobody knows, raises their hand. They ask the same question about, hey, did anybody have their car stolen? I get it, usually get one or two. Then they say, did you report it? Immediately. It's amazing. That, so we know what's going on. And this that's, goes back. Yeah, that, that's this a really go, great point. This goes back to that prosecutor, right, who talked about his, his nephew. His nephew is probably stealing yeah. to make up that difference to give him that $80 because yeah. he's, I'm sure he's not begging enough for $80, especially when he's high on drugs. So it's got to find a ways to make it up, whether it's stealing off of people's porch, whether it's walking to a store and taking something, he's finding ways to make up that difference. Hmm. So that's really what we've been seeing going on. And it's, it's really kind of frustrating. The other component of this with all of this is they've done some statistics and some studies where they do surveys the National Retailers Association did a survey, and they found that 88% of the retailers are reporting that shoplifters are more aggressive now than they've ever been. So once again, that's putting the, all the store employees at risk, yeah. and that's putting the customers at risk. Because once again, you don't know when someone's going to confront somebody. And we hear too many stories of somebody being shot or being stabbed over a bottle of liquor or stealing something from Home Depot. That just has to stop. So, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. uh, I I feel like yeah, to some extent, people have been or thieves, I should say, have been emboldened right, right. by the lack of accountability. Right. And I think uh, we're seeing this. Uh, I think a perfect example of this is the more organized retail theft crimes that we're right. seeing too. I mean, obviously, I know your focus is is more on the general day to day retail theft, which mm -hmm. I think is is something that is under talked, not talked about enough, and underreported. Um, but these organized retail theft smash and grabs are mm. so blatant. Like some of them are, they're during the day. I mean, right. it's, it's like they're happening, um, uh, without it, mostly because they know that they can probably get away with it. Yeah, ab absolutely. So and that's scary. So the San Francisco Chronicle last week had a, looked at the numbers as well. And they found out that 97% of the time, when shoplifting happened in 2023, there was no arrest. So 3% of the time, there, were, there was wow. arrest, 97% of the time. Now, you would think that'd be an anomaly, but they looked at the six sure. largest cities in California, L.A., 95% of the time. You got away with it. You broke, took something, you got away with pretty it. Pretty good rate of success. That's a pretty, yeah. We are anywhere from three to seven times the difference between us and the nation hmm. when it comes to retail theft. They're, they get that many more convictions. Mm -hmm. They're running about 20%. We're running in the 3 to 7% range. This is where we've got stuff out of balance, and it's something within our law and our criminal justice system. And I always like to, I mean, we do blame 47 for quite a bit of this, but there's other things that have, that have yeah. done it too. We've cut back on our law enforcement funding. We're at levels we haven't seen in terms of personnel since 2005. We need more cops on the street. We need more prosecutors. Plain and simple. We just don't have enough. We've looked at some of the zero bail stuff throughout the state. That also adds to that same problem. And then we've also been shrinking our prison population, which is good, but we also need space. We shrunk yeah. them and then got rid of the prison rather than shrinking the population, yeah. leaving space for us exactly. to put people. So if I was to commit any of these shoplifting events or even yeah. an organized retail theft, more than likely, I'm going to spend time in jail, if any time at all. I will never step foot in a prison. And the jails are overcrowded. If I didn't bring a weapon, they're more than likely to let me out as sooner rather than later because they got to hold people for the murder trials that are being held in their county, the rape trials are being held in their yeah. county, or people who have committed a violent, <clears throat> violent crime and, but are just serving out the end of their sentence. Well, I would just add a caveat to that, too. It's like reducing our prison population is good if, we, if those people are rehabilitated, rehabilitated right? Right. And I think this is one of the things that frustrates me about policymaking in California is there are there are policymakers that really believe that any reduction for mm -hmm. whatever purpose of the prison mm -hmm. population is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I would 
I would really push back on that and say that I think our prison population should be whatever space is required to, you know, hold accountable those that are going to continue committing crimes, right? I mean, I I think that is, at at a very basic level, that Mm -hmm. is what it should be. Now, if that's, you know, a very small population, excellent. Mm -hmm. That means we're doing a great job as a society and as a culture, Mm -hmm. you know, supporting people and raising good citizens and, you know, making sure that our, our communities are safe. If that's a larger prison population, I don't think that in itself is a bad thing. <laughs> it probably tells us that we need to be doing a little better right. at, you know, providing people opportunity and jobs and, you know, mm-hmm. treatment and, and all right. these other things. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, those people need to be held accountable, right? right. And so uh, I, I think we make it so black and white, you know, in some of these policy discussions. And it's like, no, this is this is a lot more nuanced than that. Right. Um, so... So, okay, so you, you, you gave us some statistics. What are some of the, you know, policy changes that you would like to see or that you, that have been attempted maybe uh, okay. well, know, to, to talk about? Well, there's been several attempts over the past uh, two, three years. Almost all of the ideas that we thought would do something, whether it was what we call aggregation. So if I took $100 or $200 from this store, $500 from this store in the same shopping mall, and then another $500 from another one, that's adding up to $1,200. I'm, the prosecutors aren't allowed to aggregate that, count them all together. Instead, they're mm-hmm. each three right, separate right. offenses. And right. so it's misdemeanor, 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 rather than one felony. So that's one of the things we were hoping to get changed. Add a little aggregation so that way when someone's trying to hit multiple stores, we can we can gather that up. So as opposed to that $950 limit, like as opposed to 900 at Target, 900 right. at Walmart, yeah, right, 900 at Nordstrom, Nordstrom, right, or right. whatever, right. you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, whatever's in that strip mall, you could actually, right. or uh, even different times going to the store. I went in the store once, came out, when it mm-hmm. left the property completely, we came back in. It's a, that's it's a separate, two separate crimes, two wow. separate crimes. So Maybe. we'd love to aggregate those things. That's that's one of those things we would love to see. Um, another thing is. Once again, getting back to those serial thieves, we're treating them the same. If that was my kid, the punishments would always get a little more stricter. If you're not catching on, we obviously haven't sent the right message to you. And so there should be a buildup. I don't know why we don't have that in the law. Unfortunately, the legislature can't change that because we changed it through 47, so it has to go back to the people. That's the same viewpoint on aggregation. I know there's been talk about trying to do it through the legislature, but almost... Every time public safety committees reviewed it, they've said they don't believe it would hold up constitutionally. It needs to go back to the vote of the people. So those are things we think need to go back to the people. Yeah. Um, I think there's been, this is the first year I've actually seen any bill that had anything to do with retail theft and add one day of a sentence additional, actually clear not only the public safety committee, but get on the floor and get a vote. Yeah. And so it was great to see that happen. Yeah. But a lot of this stuff isn't even baby steps. It's more just a yeah. crawl. Yeah. It, and it will probably help more the larger stores who really can aggregate, right. gather, gather all that information and, and send it out. But it's really those other two things we think will move the needle a lot more is making those sort of changes. We can make arguments of whether we need to drop down that threshold from 950 back, back down to 400. But right now, those other two changes we think are more important because now we're really addressing those serial thieves who are either hitting multiple stores in a setting or hit, coming time after time after time and not getting the message yeah. that it's not right to, to take from someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's so funny, actually, that you bring that up. Uh, the, um, the, 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 you know, the talk about potentially lowering that level. Mm-hmm. This is, I, here's why I don't think that lower uh, um, threshold gets leveled, that $950 threshold. Um, and, 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 you know, you don't need to comment on this necessarily, but one of the governor's big talking points mm-hmm. uh, for the status quo, you know, right. is is generally speaking uh, that we have, I, I think it's like the 10th toughest uh, threshold in the nation yes. or something like this is what he likes to say, right? It's right. like we've got, we have the 10th toughest threshold, you know, go to, go to Texas and the threshold's like $1,500 or something. I don't remember. Yeah. It's like, but... It, it's such a misleading statistic because what he fails to mention is that in many other states, when you commit a misdemeanor, you actually get jail time. Right. And in California, a misdemeanor is a slap on the wrist. Right. And and nobody's going to jail for a misdemeanor <laughs> in California, right? 
And so I always just find that interesting. But um, well, and they also he always points to Texas. Texas also has aggregation. So if you get two stores, <laughs> exactly, yeah. you can break the fifteen hundred, and now you now you once again you're facing a felony. Yeah, right? there you go. So there yeah. are everything's got a nuance. Yeah. So and that's the thing. It, it, like I said, there's there's a right balance point, right? We're a state of that has the death penalty. Although I know we don't enforce it anymore, but we have the death penalty, and it's for the most egregious of crimes. Mm-hmm. But you go to other countries, that death penalty is for a whole lot different than what we have. I look at where we are now in terms of theft. I think our laws are so soft that it's not doing, like we said once again, that deterrence. Yeah, and it's not, true. and it's also not pushing people to that rehabilitation. Yeah, and we need to work to get those two to working well together, because otherwise, yeah, we're just going to keep. It's to me once again, it's the Einstein's definition of insanity to repeat sure. something over and over and expect a different result. We've been doing this now for ten years. Yeah, we see the results. The results are quite obvious. And the only real change we had throughout of, throughout this was COVID. Yeah. And COVID knocked all our crime numbers down, but they were on the climb up until COVID. They dropped down, and now we're now, now, we're, now we're spiking again. Uh, speaking of that, did you see this? The FBI like revised their crime statistics recently. Yes. yes. Did, so what's the deal with that? Because like I, I I saw that and I was kind of blown away. And, and it's not just like, oh, you know, we messed up. We forgot to carry a two. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh, yeah. So what we said was crime went down a little bit, but it actually went up. Yes. Well, like that it, was wild. I, I know. But sometimes they'll get information. I hate to say this, but they don't always get it's every, more of the reporting issue. It, right? It's like the reporting the, yeah, from yeah, everybody yeah, okay, and how yeah, each yeah. state reports. We've changed how we report over a couple of years ago. So it's Got also it. hard to sense. find that fourth. We used to have that 450 mark and you could see. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The delineation. We've changed that, so it's a lot harder to figure that number out now. Yeah, it, I just thought it was really yeah. interesting. But, yeah, yeah. That, that that does explain it mm-hmm. for sure. So a lot of the focus of the legislature this year was on organized retail crime. Correct. Right? And I think, again, to your point, you, you know, more of a crawl. I, I, I do agree with you. I, I supported those bills. I think they're bills that are going to allow us to go after the most egregious of offenses, mm-hmm. the really organized, targeted, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, attacks on big retailers, right? Right. But, but I think, and I've talked to DAs about this, so this isn't just me talking, but it's going to be a lot harder to use that as a tool to go after everyday crime that is happening, retail theft that's happening in our communities. And so, you know, that I think that is why we definitely need to, you know, we need to do more. So, um, well. So, so I've oh, got, go a, I, I got a couple ideas yeah. on that. Well, first of all, in the legislation, there was lots of good stuff that was passed, but there was one bill that we were all kind of, Really kind of hoping to see pass, and that was uh, Wendy Carrillo. Actually, a Democrat had yeah. had, a, had a great idea, yeah. and that was to make it easier to charge for misdemeanors yes. for law enforcement. Because the current law is they have to witness it, yep. and if not, you have to basically do a citizen's arrest. So if you're the store owner, I've got a site that I saw it, I witnessed it. Here's yeah. my video, and I've got to show up in court. Well, if I don't show up in court, there's no ticket, there's no nothing. So. This is where we once again we got to get back to make it a little bit easier for law enforcement to do their job. Yeah. Um, what ended up happening with that bill again? I, I know we passed it out of the assembly. Yeah. That's what happened to it. <laughs> it <laughs> okay, was right, it, it right, was yeah. it was done there. Suddenly it disappeared. It. It's amazing. Right. Good ideas that is amazing. tend to die quite often, as you know, with your own bill the yeah. year before that yep. just mysteriously I died. I, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> it happens a lot. Sadly. So so. For us, one of our biggest things we're pushing now, and, and I think your your listeners may have heard of Proposition 36 that's sure. on the ballot, um, we think that's a great fix for in a lot of ways. Yeah. One, what we're going to do is we're targeting serial thefts. If you've committed three or more thefts in the past and you commit another shoplift, you can face a potential felony. doesn't mean you will. It means there is that potential. Sure. That's up to the prosecutor and it's up to the judge. So they're the two who will make that determination. First, the prosecutor, if he's even going to charge the crime as such, and then the judge still has discretion. So it doesn't take anything away from the judge to say you must sentence him as a felon. doesn't tell the mm-hmm. prosecutor that you must charge as a felon. If someone just stole a candy bar, I don't see anyone ever charging that. But yeah. it's there as a tool. Right. The other thing it does is it focuses a lot on some of the drug problems, and it has some enhanced drug penalties. But the third part, which I think is the most important part, is there's a big push for rehabilitation. You have the option to opt out of going after going for that prison sentence and instead going for rehabilitation for your mental health, for your substance abuse. Yep. And that to me is a big thing. And I, 
hope your listeners one day will get a chance to kind of go to one of these facilities. I had the opportunity to tour multiple times the Delancey Street down in San Francisco. Mm. And it's really a spot of last resort. Almost everybody there has been convicted multiple times for drug offenses. And they're there working their way out because if they don't do this, they're going to prison. Yeah. And so they're learning a skill, whether it's to help in construction world, they also run a restaurant. And I've been in there with a the restaurant. I was a scout leader, took the scouts through. Mm. And it was a great learning experience where we they would hear the death by a thousand cuts. The kids started drinking, started started taking cough syrup, then went started working towards drugs, then skipped school, then left home mm. and ended up on the streets. And the person we were talking to was telling us this great story of how we got there. And he says, but I am now 12 wow. months sober. I've got to do another eight months. And then I'm out of the, then I'm out of the program and I can go do stuff, but they all live together. They go through counseling. The, awesome. the, the most unique thing was for the kids. They're talking. He asked the kids, where are you from? And the kids all go, we're from Sacramento. And he goes, Oh, that's funny. I'm, I was originally from Sacramento. And he goes, you guys probably don't know my high school though. I went to El Camino high school. <laughs> Half of my kids there went to El Camino. The other half were going to Rio Americano, and they were like, Amazing. oh, my God, this could be me. He goes, it can be you. That's powerful. But there's so many times I had a chance to stop, and nobody either intervened or I didn't wow. catch on. And so that's what we want to see. We want to see people going to rehab because we want them to go back on the straight and narrow. We want to be productive yeah. members of society. We 100%. don't want to see people locked up. We want to see people helping others out. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, well, I appreciate that breakdown. I uh, you know, it, from the legislative perspective, I will say there was a number of attempts in the legislative process this yes. year to either pull Proposition 36 off the ballot. There was a, 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 <laughs> a minute where they talked about the governor and some legislators talked about proposing a competing initiative. I mean, it was really wild. Mm -hmm. Some of the discussions that went on, all of those attempts failed. And mm -hmm. so I do think it's important that voters are going to get a chance to make their voices right. heard on that. Uh, especially after the um, all of the attempts to silence that, right? Well, so, well, well and I also want to say, say I always look at it and I go, it's not Democrats, it's the liberal Democrats, because there were plenty of Democrats who supported 36 and are in support, not only, yeah. not only in the local area, not only whether it's local city council members or mayors, but we're also seeing elected state legislators who also support it. So there's clearly support. There's just this group that cannot let cannot allow one person to have one additional day behind bars, cannot see criminal justice system add additional punishment for any you know, way, shape, or form. We've seen it. I'm sure you've seen it with uh, Senator Shannon Grove's bills on sex trafficking. I mean, talk about some of the worst of the worst people, yep. and we can't even can't even attack those those types of criminals with a more stringent sentence. It took pulling teeth and yep. multiple years and embarrassment. To move that move that needle, true. and so this is what we're facing. It's not all of them, yeah. But there's a portion of them, and they're controlling the power. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's tough, building. right? Because it, it's it's amazing some of the conversations I have, pretty more generally about retail theft mm -hmm. and, and homelessness, and there's yeah. a, there's a number of other topics, um, you know, within that. There's so much bipartisan support, right? You know, for for for. There's so much. I, let me let me rephrase it this way. There's so much bipartisan frustration about the status quo. <laughs> yes, right. I think that's probably a better way to frame it. Um, and so because of that, there's bipartisan support for change, right? And mm -hmm. I think uh, that is definitely something we're seeing more with the Wendy Carrillo bill, for example. Yeah. Who, by the way, you know, uh, she's one of my colleagues in the assembly. Mm -hmm. She got some serious pushback from some Absolutely, of her colleagues yeah. on the other side, uh, on her side of the aisle, mm -hmm. I should say. Um, uh, you know, for for even introducing that bill, even right. bringing that bill forward. And so uh, I think it's really, it's good to see that there are bipartisan voices mm -hmm. uh, really trying to introduce policies and and introduce legislation that is, is going to help change this. So uh, I think with that, I would love to, I mean, if you have any final thoughts, we'd love to uh, let you so, close. So, so uh, there are a couple of things I was going to let you know. One of the things I always find interesting is when nothing else is happening, people find a way to, ha to how to address the problem. So yeah. businesses are addressing the problems themselves. I told you about some of the stores yep. who are doing locking carts, more cameras. We've seen all those things. One of my favorites is there's this store down, down in Los Angeles. They've had repeat theft after th theft after theft of shoplifting. The owner got so fed up with it that he actually started to take pictures of the people taking it, <laughs> posting it on his Instagram account, 
and saying, do you know this person? Wow. Getting responses back from people, linking them back to their social media pages, reading up about them, putting their little bio up there and say, they stole from me. And by the way, here they are partying now in Coachella. So he puts the picture. Wow. Up. In another instance, a person was actually the leader of a 12-step program. The only reason why he knew he was the leader of a 12-step program is the guy dropped his business card on the way out. He oh had God. the picture. He looked it up. He's making poster-sized pictures describing the crimes they committed and what they're doing now. They are now come, people are now coming back saying, will you please remove your stuff off your social media and off, your, off the front of your building? And he goes, no, but thank you for paying. But I'm not going to remove it. I will put the note that you paid. But it's like <laughs> you committed the crime. I can't get yeah. LAPD to do anything. And even if LAPD did something, I know the district attorney down here is not going to do anything. So that's the way he's answered wow. it. Then that you, is some serious social yeah. pressure there. I love it. Then you get places like Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is going above and beyond to tr truly trying to address crime. They're running drones. They're flying over the area constantly. If something happens, they go and ticket. They know this may not lead to a lot of convictions, but they're basically saying you're not wanted. So he no. owns a store in Beverly Hills and in West and in L.A. All his troubles are in L.A. No yeah. problems, problems in Beverly Hills. He says, I'll get an occasional burglary. Occasional shoplift, yeah. and it's just chased away. And we're seeing more and more cities doing things like this. Uh, city of Stockton started putting up signs telling people, we're watching you. We're going to make sure we're not going to allow retail theft to happen yeah. here. They started an app. So if someone broke in right now, started wow. taking items, you can, through the app, send the information directly to the, to the police and to the DA. So they're both getting real-time info because if that same person leaves Stockton, yeah. goes to a neighboring city, and they find the same information. Now they've got a, a bigger case against the individual rather than I didn't get the one from series because it happened in a right. different city. So they start aggregating that information. So everyone's coming up with new and unique approaches yeah. to try and address this. A lot of places are offering cameras uh, at discount or free to businesses. If put it awesome. up, yeah. film everything. That way we've got a video record so we can use it. These are the things that everyone else is doing. And we've talked about all the items that are being locked up. Now we just need the state to do something. I know you fought hard to do it. Absolutely. But, and I know there's plenty of others in the Capitol fighting hard to there's do it. There's a lot of them. Yeah, for sure. It's just the people in power are not letting yeah. things go forward. Yeah. And hopefully we're starting to see that change. I, I think so. I think so. I think we're starting to see that tide turn. And I think uh, the, the really important thing, and I always emphasize this, like, it helps so much to hear from your constituents, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think more and more people in districts across the state are hearing from constituents, like, right? You know, hey, when is this going to change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's a really good thing, right? Um, well, and if any of your listeners care, they can always check out uh, cart.org. C yes, C A R R T dot C A R R T dot org dot org, and we're always looking for additional coalition members. Awesome. We're, we're doing events in regular basis throughout the area to also tell you right. things you can do as a store owner to help reduce crime. Or we also bring in law enforcement, whether it's the police or the or the DA, so they can come in and explain to you what they need to help make make the case for when someone does break in. It's so. awesome. I also have been on the website, and you've got some really good retail theft facts and <laughs> yes. figures on there too, which is really good to thanks good information to have. So. Um, well, I, I just want to say thank you, Matt, for coming mm -hmm. on and uh, and talking with us today. I think this is such a timely and important issue. It's mm -hmm. an issue that I know me as a elected representative hears a lot about from my business owners, mm -hmm. hears a lot about from community members. And so really appreciate the work right. you're doing on this and, and, and appreciate you coming on. So, Well, well, thank you. And, and like I said, it was a pleasure working with you a couple months ago when we were hearing from yeah. some of the stores yeah. and hearing them mother daughter teenage daughter working with her mom and stealing items and things of that nature yeah it's just amazing to hear what people are doing and that's why we need to see some change and that's why we need things that create that deterrence and create a push towards rehabilitation yeah because sure. right now what we're doing isn't working for sure the great way to end it to share to share your ideas for future shows you can email me at point of order pod at gmail.com you can listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can watch, subscribe, or follow on YouTube, X, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook at Point of Order Pod. You can follow uh, myself on X at Joshua underscore Hoover. And then again, uh, if you want to check, learn more about CART, uh, you can go to C-A-R-R-T dot org. Mm -hmm. uh, if I got that one right. You uh, did. Matt, thanks again. I <laughs> uh, hope to see you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. See ya.